Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, our panel today is um, Northeast Asia, the Balkans of the 21st century, question mark. Um, for many years, we have looked to East Asia as the driver of the global economy. China is the world's second largest economy. Japan is the world's third largest. South Korea is either 13 or 14, depending on where you look. Um, and this is undoubtedly part of the reason for the so-called pivot strategy of the Obama administration, where its foreign policy has uh, shifted increasingly from the Middle East and Europe towards East Asia and South Asia. Hillary Clinton defined this policy shift towards East Asia as involving a strengthening of bilateral security alliances, deepening our working relationships with emerging powers, including with China, engaging with regional multilateral institutions, expanding trade and investment, forging a broad-based military presence, and advancing democracy and human rights. Now, some scholars see this as part of US's China containment policy, though, of course, the US denies ever having such a policy. Um, but many believe that the US is seeking to retain its hegemony in the region by limiting China's economic and political power. Whatever the US role, this is a time of increasing tension between the countries within this region. China recently declared an air defense identification zone, asserting dominance over the East China Sea, including the Senkaku Islands, which Japan believes is under its dominion, as well as, South Korean claimed Soko as, well as the South Korean claimed Socotra Rock. The US, of course, used this opportunity to reassert its support of its allies, Japan and South Korea. Unfortunately, there are increasing tensions between Japan and South Korea, with Japan's politicians recently visiting the Yasukuni Shrine, where the spirits of, the convicted Japanese, of convicted Japanese war criminals are amongst those honored. Korea has been very vocal about its perception that Japan has not sufficiently taken responsibility for Korean comfort women during the war. These are all current reflections of historical tensions between these countries. The question for our panel today is going to be how these political, historical, and nationalistic tensions play out in the face of economic growth, which has been such a driving force in recent years. Our panel today is going to look a little bit different than was originally planned. Um, unfortunately, neither James Kurth nor Bruce Cummings could be with us today. Um, Tom Ferguson uh, will be presenting James Kurth's paper instead. Uh, Tom, as many of you know, is the uh, Director of Research Projects at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He's also a member of our advisory board and a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts in Boston and a senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Professor Chow, who is, you want to, oh, sorry, uh, is going to be Professor Shang who is a distinguished fellow at the Fung Global Institute, uh, which works very closely with INET. He's also chief advisor to the China Banking Regulatory Commission and a member of the Future of Finance Advisory Council, the International Advisory Council of the China Investment Corporation. He serves as an advisor to the UN Environment Program inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system and is also an adjunct professor at the University of Malaya and the Tsinghua and the Tsinghua University School of Economics and Management. And Professor Chow is Vice Chairman and Secretary General of the Shanghai Development and Research Foundation, a nonprofit institute with, purpose, uh, with the purpose of promoting research on issues of development. He is also the President of the Excellence Academy of Development Research. And I think the order we're going to go in today is we're going to start with Tom, and then Professor Shang, and then Professor Chow. Uh, my name is Pia Malani. I'm going to be chairing the session. And um, Tom is unfortunately going to have to leave after his presentation leave because he yeah. has <laughs> <laughs> something else right after this. Um, but after we are done with the rest of the presentations, I can take questions for Professor Cheng and Professor Chow. So why don't we start with Tom? Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm glad to be here, but not under the circumstances in which I uh, have to. Uh, I guess I won't let a cat out of the bag to say that Bruce Cummings and James Kurth are both very close friends of mine. At my wedding, the best man was Bruce Cummings and James Kurth was the usher. Uh, and it has been like that for many years. 
Uh, and so when we were going to do Northeast Asia, it seemed pretty obvious to invite them. Alas, with just a few hours to go before he took off, I'm not, I think, letting a cat out of the bag. He's not keeping it secret. Turned out, he turned out to have an 80% artery blockage, oh, which means that you know he might never have landed. Um, and so he couldn't come. Bruce has a... Um, a less serious problem, but a real one. It's not a medical emergency, and so there was nothing to be done. Now, particularly since Kurth and I talk all the time, I thought, okay, I could step into this if I had to with Kurth's blessing. I thought about trying to do the Cummings paper, but I just thought there are limits uh, to what you can do. And I confess I've been a bit depressed for the whole week because of the various problems, not only they, but other my friends have had. So I, there are days I feel like the uh, knight in the Durer etching of uh, night, death, and devil, if you know it. Um, and so I thought one paper was enough. And my other problem is, is exactly as Pia said, uh, I've got a schedule conflict. I've got to go give my own panel uh, paper at, at three o'clock. So I am in the somewhat embarrassing position of having to bleat and run. Uh, but also, since a good part of Jim Kurth's paper has to do with Chinese conceptions of China, I'd be extremely interested in what Andrew Shang and Yi Kia have to say uh, about this. I, mean, I know them both, and uh, I, I, I think I would say, I think I can say that they're probably. Now, I understand your case is somewhat complicated. The Chinese I most respect and almost in the whole planet. So, um, I mean, I, yours, I know, being not quite a simple assessment over there of, of exactly who's where in China, as it were. Uh, but the, um, so I thought, okay, I'll try this. Um, and I wanna like keep myself out of it um, and try to do Jim's paper. Um, and the paper's actually up on um, the INET website, and uh, I don't mind saying, I think it's a really brilliantly written paper. It's absolutely characteristic of Kurth. Um, and I, it, the, the combination there of huge familiarity with the material, a lot of practical experience, uh, and an extremely clear writing and thinking style, uh, it's it's... Uh, it's very much worth reading. It's my, my presentation is no substitute uh, for reading it, okay? So, um, he begins with the fairly obvious observation, exactly that, you know, as Pia said, there's been plenty of clashes between the, uh, in, the uh, in the Chinese, the three littoral seas, as Kurth would put it, uh, South China Sea, East China Sea, and what, you know, we in the West often call the Yellow Sea, but which I gather in China is sometimes called the North China Sea. At any rate, there's been a fair amount of um, tension there, especially since 2010. But Kurth makes an interesting observation. He says, well, if you're worried about the World War I analogy, which a lot of people were, I have to say, when I went out to uh, Asia a year ago, I was pretty stunned at the, I hear bankers suddenly talking about the possibility of a war. And I had never heard that in my lifetime. Uh, I mean, I, I abstract from things like the Cuban Missile Crisis when I was too young to be talking to bankers or at least even understand what they did. Um, and, but um, that was a shock. And that shook a lot of people up. Uh, but Kurth makes the point that if you're worried about the World War I analogy, um, Whereas, you know, the Balkans were, well, balkanized. There were lots of small states there that were uh, somebody's cat's paw or dependent, and there was an enormous amount of, of, of uh, instability in it. There's nothing like that in Northeast Asia. I mean, you know, China, Japan, uh, Russia, uh, Korea, um, and then you, can, you can throw in, if you like, the Philippines, which probably belongs there, although maybe not Northeast Asia at that point. Um, these are states. They're not small dependencies and things like that. Obviously, the Philippines has a different relation to the U.S., but uh, balkanization is not your problem here. So why worry? And Kurth's answer is, well, there's basically two things going on here that you want to look at. One is the dynamics, the historical record on the dynamics of hegemonic transitions. 
and then what happens in alliance systems in those uh, situations. And he rapidly, you know, he, he walks you through what is pretty obvious in, uh, in hegemonic transitions, going all the way back to Philip II of Spain, uh, France after Louis XIV, uh, England in the 19th century, ending in World War I, et cetera, is that those do seem to be uh, really bad news. That is, somebody ends up shooting at some point. And similarly, uh, lots of people looked at World War I and said, oh, this alliance system was really terrible where the, the, the great powers split into blocks. Um, but Kurth says, you know, well, all right, yeah, the record is pretty terrible. So in that sense, if, if you're run on a sort of frequentist theory of probability, that's my term, not his, and look at the, the run there, it's not so nice. On the other hand, as Kurth puts it, the, the Cold War is actually kind of interesting from the standpoint of uh, systems of international systems of, well, hegemony, okay, if you'll go along with the US for that. Um, because ultimately what you had, there was a combination of deterrence and containment, and there was no war. That is to say, uh, you came, what you came close to in the um, US-Russia uh, case, you nearly, you had two real shooting wars that were big, Korea and Vietnam, and you had a number of nuclear near misses, and the problem with nuclear near misses is you only have to have one hit uh, to have a real mess. But, you know, in the end, um, you have a problem. Uh, but it wasn't overwhelming, and the system didn't collapse, and it didn't end the war. So Kurth says, let's look at the US-China relationship from that standpoint. Um, and there he says, there's a couple things you want to look at. Uh, one is, is what do people do when they try to break out of containment? And, or in other words, if you take it for granted, this is, this is now the international relations professor Kurth talking, that the US is trying to contain China. Uh, maybe the power that's rising might try to break out at some point. That was the German case in World War I. Uh, where, I mean, effectively a version of the Fritz Fischer thesis is presupposed as true in the Kurth uh, paper, and he's right, uh, I think, despite all these new books on World War I. And then the, your other alternative is once in a while you will get great powers trying to contain, uh, par pardon me, to appease, that is to say, like the way the British dealt with the rising U.S. was very different from the way they dealt with the rising Germany. Basically, they tried to give the U.S. Uh, more or less everything they wanted. Um, as, or at least as much as they had to, especially after Lord Lansdowne became foreign minister around 1903 or 1904. Okay, so uh, Kurth starts walking you through sort of what is the Chinese and American alliance systems. Well, the Chinese don't really have many allies except North Korea, and my own, t I, I think most of us suspect that, eh, I, I bet even the Chinese leadership some days would like not to have that fo those folks uh, as their alliance. In any case, if you want it, you can have it. Uh, the, the more uh, threateningly, however, the U.S. has lots of allies in that region. Um, it, um, and the thing to watch, and this is a very nice piece of the Kurth paper, is how the U.S. has been extending its security guarantees, a sort of classic alliance dynamic story, where um, the, in, back in November uh, 2011, to almost nobody noticing, the U.S. extended the security guarantee uh, of the Philippines, which it has to some of those islands, the Spratleys in particular. Uh, and then in the fall of 2012, we all know about the sudden U.S. decision by President Obama to make the U.S. Uh, security guarantee to Japan cover the, well, how shall I have to choose a name? I'm going to say Senkaku slash Dionyu, and the, my Chinese colleagues can just laugh at my attempt to pronounce that. Um, and Kurth says, you know, this is a real problem because uh, you've got ambiguity here in this guarantee because when you guarantee, for instance, a lot of small islands with the Philippines, when is an island an island, which is becoming a, quite a big question? And like, are you really gonna sort of not trying to go to war over like, you know, something a little bigger than a, a soccer field? Um, and then the point Kurth makes in this part of his paper is this, this always is good for generating arms races and probably a series of crises. And while each one of those has a low probability of something bad happening, when you run, you know, when you run a big sequence of low probability events, uh, you know, then you will eventually, your, your probability goes up if only by 
um, you know, just a sheer mistake. Um, but Kurth says, again, maybe this won't be fatal. And he takes the case where there once was a problem before uh, of um, the Kimoy and Matsu, two small islands off the coast of China. Back in the late 50s, uh, the Chinese and the Americans had a series of clashes over that. Then Khrushchev told the Chinese, uh, we're not actually going to back you up if you get into a war uh, with uh, the US over this. And so the Chinese uh, chilled, as it were. Um, and so Kurth says, you know, once in a while you will see a kind of back down uh, from something, and so maybe this is reason for it. Then he wants, however, to say in, in his paper, that's sort of, this is all, however, a very Western approach. What do Chinese see about uh, this sort of thing? And, you know, here, Kurth has been in China at some length and talked at great length with uh, a lot of senior Chinese folks, uh, including a fair number of people. It surprised me that he got in. Uh, but the, uh, at any rate, um, his suggestion is, well, the Chinese mostly think of themselves as the central kingdom. I'm going to have to go over to this to the point of caricature because I want to get done in 15 minutes. Uh, and you've got a cyclical conception of time, uh, but it's not uh, simply, um, you know, it's not just we go around forever. We have these d declines and rises, and so it's not a huge surprise if uh, after a long decline, you'd see a long rise. Um, and then the suggestion in, in Kurth is the Chinese conception of power is basically you don't try to do war except as a last resort. Um, the, uh, and you don't typically begin by shooting cannon. They're kind of, he, his, his metaphor is the cannon under the curtain. Uh, and he does then, I mean, here we, you know, this, we are obviously talking stylizations here in a short paper. The suggestion is that Chinese military strategy is big on encirclement and sudden blows, but you don't typically try to smash up the opponent to nothing. You try to make, it's always a him, I guess, in this language. Um, the, uh, you, you try to make the opponent realize it's just in their interest to just go along uh, and maybe just join the general run of uh, tributary states. Um, so now his suggestions are, if you look at this in the, China, if you look at the evolution of the Northeast Asian strategy in the last few years by both, by China, what you see is, well, yes, they're actually trying to sort of slowly encroach in, you know, their three C's. Uh, and they have this interesting possibility of the use of financial power. Now, what Kurth's basic line of argument in this paper uh, is essentially, Look, there's the military problems in the three Cs basically boil down to huge amounts of anti-ship ballistic missiles, which basically means the U.S. Navy has to pull back. I, I will just add, I know that's people in the Navy, when they're sailing around with aircraft carriers, are very aware of this. Uh, it's, it's not like you just go uh, send a ship to 150 miles off course or off the coast anymore or something like that. Um, and, uh, and then there is, says Kurth, now this is Kurth talking, it doesn't matter what I think. The, uh, he says, uh, well, there is also, of course, the enormous holding of Chinese, uh, by the Chinese of dollars, uh, which could, he thinks, conceivably be used. Uh, but his suggestion uh, is, well, is this really going to happen? And there his suggestion is, no, probably not in the end, at least maybe not for a long time, because after all, the Chinese don't think they have to win all at once. Uh, and they also think they have, if you like, the wind at their back. Uh, and they don't have a history of sort of pushing things to extremes. If they encounter resistance, they sort of often rethink it. And similarly, Kurth makes the point <clears throat> very nicely, stated just baldly, um, which is that American strategy toward China is really in the hands of largely a government that's run by various business sectors. Um, and all of them would like to trade with China. Uh, and so neither the Americans nor the Chinese really have any early on incentive to do something stupid. Your fundamental problem in the Kurth, as Kurth ends his paper is simply to say, you know, but you are going to run into these series of crises one after the other, what people sometimes call punctuated equilibria, which uh, Kurth, the term he doesn't use. And so if somebody miscalculates, yeah, something can go wrong. 
Uh, and that's a real problem, but it doesn't seem to be on the surface inevitable. That was Jim Kurth's paper. I regret only that he's not here today to present it. Uh, well, uh, I, I really like to thank uh, INET for inviting me here. I'm a real amateur in this um, geopolitical game, but I um, is the slide on? Is it? Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, but I, I think uh, uh, I have an advantage in the sense that I'm, I'm looking at it with fresh eyes. And uh, uh, I came to realize, my, my own background is a finance. And uh, I came to realize the importance of geopolitics uh, uh, and, and security uh, during the Asian crisis. When, when you know, uh, Thailand, who was the best ally of the United States during the Vietnam War, was not helped. Okay, and uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, and then you know when it reached Korea, uh, you know massive aid ca came in, and then I asked uh, somebody who should know. I said, why is this? He says, you got to realize that the United States only help countries which, where they have got troops. Uh, in and of course, you know the United States had troops in uh, in South Korea, and you know it was at that particular point of time during the Asian crisis uh, that the State Department and the Defense Department intervened on what was essentially a minister, a, a Treasury uh, decision on whether or not to help uh, uh, you know the Asian economies in trouble. Now, with that perspective, um, you need to uh, look at uh, we're here in a conference on new economic thinking. We need to realize that we're dealing with systemic issues, right? That's, you know, uh, uh, and conflict uh, is part of that system, right? Economics is all about money and finance and, and jobs and etc. But uh, national security is very, very important. And so uh, one needs to think about this. So, uh, 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 so the, 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 the question that came around, which I thought was very intriguing, was, you know, is Northeast Asia the new Balkans of the 21st century? And if you go back and look at the Balkans, Balkans were essentially, you know, the southeast uh, corner of Europe, right, with a very complicated population group. Okay? Uh, uh, you know, uh, Al you know uh, uh, Albania, Bulgaria, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Greece, you know, it, 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 it's Muslims mixed with uh, uh, Orthodox Church, with, you know, uh, you know it, it really is mixed, right? And, uh, uh, you know, that was a conflict amongst themselves, but they were pawns of big power plays, right? Russia, uh, uh, you know, Aust uh, Austrian-Hungarian uh, Empire, the Ottoman Empire, et you know, etc. cetera. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, uh, it's, it's a big power game in which the Balkan countries were pawns. But if you look at uh, uh, Northeast Asia, you know, you're talking about very big countries, uh, uh, you know, pretty powerful economically, uh, and also nuclear powers. Right? Of course, the United States is, is, is there, but they're all nuclear powers. So, you know, after Hiroshima, uh, the game changed, right? The nuclear powers, the nuclear options, and it's Armageddon. It's zero one. It's Armageddon or, 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 you know, everybody loses. Which is why I am actually basically quite confident um, that, you know, uh, Northeast Asia is not the Balkans, uh, 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 you, know, of, of, you know, of all this. And let's, you know, even though... Uh, uh, you know, South Korea, uh, sorry, North Korea uh, threatens to be a nuclear power, and we don't know, and we're all worried about it. But we all know that technologically, both South Korea and Japan can switch to uh, becoming nuclear powers very, very quickly. So, we, you know, uh, let's have no illusions that Russia, China, Japan, Korea, uh, and America are in a nuclear standoff uh, in, in Northeast Asia. And everybody understands this, okay, right? 
Everybody understands this, and I think that 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 that's an issue. So my, you know, my 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 my, bo my bottom line is that skirmishes can occur, you know, little little conflicts can occur, misunderstandings will occur, but everybody at the back of their head knows that you know if you escalate this, Armageddon will occur, and if you really then think about it, you know, since the Second World War and other than the Korean uh, conflict, uh, uh, Northeast Asia has been a region of peace, and that region of stability and peace was what created the global supply chain. Okay, and uh, in broad economic terms, that global supply chain uh, 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 had. Uh, uh, produces roughly 46% of the world's manufacturing exports, uh, uh, you know, uh, of which 20% is, is, is minimum by, 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 by this Northeast Asia uh, uh, group. Now, some of these skirmishes can occur by little accidents like these, right? I don't think uh, 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 you know, uh, Prime Minister Abe was intensive with in, intend this, but 731, that photograph caused a huge outrage in South Korean media and parts of Southeast Asia, you know, because the, that was the unit that did uh, medical tests uh, during the Second World War. And if you, if you want to know what happened, just Google it. I'm not going to go uh, into this uh, uh, aspects of it. Now, let's, let's, let's then look at the, um, the military equation, right? The United States, you know, uh, uh, may have been a little bit hurt by the uh, crisis, uh, you know, of 2007, 2009, but it's uh, no big deal. It still spends 4% of their GDP uh, and four times that of the nearest, which is China, right? Uh, the, the United States has been in active warfare, um, uh, uh, um, you know, since the, you know, sort of Iraq war, uh, with the best tested pilots, Navy, uh, Army, uh, you can think of, and the PLA has not been tested since 1979, right? So, you know, it, to, to think about conflicts in this area, I think is just, just in my view, you know, uh, 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 you know, unlikely. But the Job's political viewpoint is, you know, America's pivot to the Pacific. So, you know, I, I, I read all this stuff by, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton stuff and all that sort of stuff. And it was very funny, in my view. America pivots to the East and the West, you know, Ukraine blows up, the Middle East blows up. What is America doing? Can America fight three-front war at the same time? And is there even, uh, you know, a, a, a conflict when that conflict will ultimately aim up and end with with um, uh, you know nuclear Armageddon, but look at look at what has happened. You know, by an, they announced America announced sixty percent of its naval forces will be in the Pacific, guarding against what? China then says, okay, you're going to guard yourself my exports of containers to to your shores. I'm going to look west. One belt, one road, redefines the game, right? Because, you know, if you really look at, you know, uh, uh, all these studies of, of geopolitics about the coming, you know, U.S.-China war, et cetera, et cetera, it's all about Euro-Asia, right? America is on one side de defended by Atlantic and by Pacific. Nobody can touch it in terms of, you know, its military, military forces. But where are the conflicts? It's either in Europe or in Asia, in East Asia, and uh, in the middle, you know, blank. I mean, of course, there's uh, Middle East, etc. But people have not uh, dealt with. And China realizes that, you know, in the future, the markets historically has been through the Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road. But the Maritime Silk Road needs to go through the Malacca Straits, of which the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Pacific Fleet is in control of. And so if you have that westward view, develop that area full of natural resources, full of markets, nobody's in conflict, right? Of course, you know, there are uh, uh, areas and, and if, if these countries develop, and, and, and where does that mindset come from? Where does that thinking come from? Africa was, went through its difficult period fundamentally because 
the, 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 the West, which controlled the, 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 the trade and the aid institutions, said, I won't lend to you, I won't invest in you until, you know, and even though I may have uh, a very complex uh, protect, agricultural protection, etc., cetera, uh, uh, you subject yourself to lots of conditionality. The, what has happened with, with Africa? China has gone in there, built the infrastructure, you know, uh, bought all the, uh, 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 the natural resources, and Africa has revived. The same with Latin America. So if, 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 if that, you know, sort of uh, uh, central uh, Euro-Asia develops and becomes better in terms of infrastructure, cheaper in terms of uh, transactions to uh, uh, Africa and Latin America, we do not need to conflict uh, each other in terms of trade, investments, etc. You know, I mean, that, 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 that is the heart of the uh, multipolar world, which causes some unease uh, in some quarters, but I don't think uh, the world is still, uh, 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 still, 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 still large enough to deal with this. Now, you know, this is the problem with the, uh, uh, um, the, 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 the mindsets. You know, uh, when I used to work at the World Bank, uh, we always used to say, uh, you know, a, a country officer goes to another country and applies the lessons he learned in the previous country. Uh, the problem with this uh, uh, crisis uh, is that we're dealing with a 21st century uh, financial crisis with the mindset of the 19th century, right? Uh, the tools of the 20th, 19th century. And what was the uh, 19th century mindset? Uh, conflicts in land, sea, air. But today, 21st century is about space, cyberspace. Okay? But the bottom line is still the same. It's about economics, trade, and investments. Uh, today, you know, we talk about currency wars. Uh, we talk about you know, uh, culture, centralized versus decentralized politics, democracy versus autocracy. I don't want to get into this uh, emotional side of it. But one area that is very clear in my mind, religion has raised its head uh, and has become the center of conflict uh, worldwide, right? Not just fundamentalism uh, in, 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 in Eastern religions, but also fundamentalism in Western religions, right? Uh, uh, and and, and, and that, 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 that raises certain conflicts. But also technology and innovation has changed. And of course, demo, demo, demogra demography is, is very critical. I mean, conflicts arise because of changing migration. Uh, uh, if I may be very, very blunt about this, uh, basically what ISIS and Boko Haram is doing is to say that we are going to conquer territory uh, because I, we don't recognize the borders written by the colonial wars. Okay? I mean, you think about it you know, in, 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 in that sense. But what is really happening? I mean, as I said, you know, the, 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 the China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan are the core of the global supply chain in manufacturing. And, and increasingly, China will become a major part of the market in itself. Uh, 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 and not just the market of itself, but also the market for, 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 for its neighbors. And trade with each other is already 847 billion, or 11.7% of their total trade of 7.3 trillion. OK? So they're bound already you know, in a complex network uh, that, that you know, they will be stupid to go and destroy through a conflict. And that's why I think you know, uh, accidents can happen. Uh, but uh, uh, you, know, you and I know that Chinese factories assemble a large amount of Japanese, Korean, Taiwanese goods. And to, today, you know, roughly one fifth of Japanese trade Korean and Taiwan trade is with China. So why should they want to have conflict and destroy the breadbasket for the bulk of the population, right? Uh, and then, you know, today, uh, you know, Japanese services of re uh, revival, uh, you, know, you know, just one third of that tourism comes from Korean and Chinese tourists, right? Uh, so there is so much uh, uh, interaction irrespective of that, what I call the, uh, the, the um, uh, posturing that can occur. So my, you know, that's my bottom line. I think uh, Northeast Asia is not another Balkans. 
uh, it's much less risky than the Middle East and Central Europe because there is the balance of power between the new clean nuclear players. Uh, and as long as people understand that the US-China relations, and that's the key, and the possible reunification of the Korean Peninsula, which would be similar to the German reunification, except that you know, instead of 60-40 uh, unification in Germany, it would be two to one, right? Uh, uh, that's my understanding. Uh, uh, and so the burden uh, of, um, of uh, Korean unification on the richer uh, South Korea could be quite uh, complicated, put it this way. Um, and, 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 and so in my view, uh, uh, the, 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 the population mix of the Northeast Asia is much more distinct. It's unlike the Balkans, where relig the differences of, I mean, it's intermixing of the population and the religion. Uh, Ukraine is about, uh, you know, some people don't, may, may, may not be aware of this, is a lot of it is due to the Russians left behind uh, in Ukraine, right? And the Balkans was about, uh, you know, Muslims, uh, Christians, uh, you know, et cetera, issues. So, uh, and, and, and that, that area is much more complicated because there are proxy wars that are going on. Uh, whereas in, um, in Northeast uh, uh, Asia, we're talking about principles talking. That means they are nuclear powers themselves. They fully understand their, their, their differences. They fully understand you know, their interests. And I think you know, uh, they're unlikely to have a, a, a fundamental issue. So let me stop there, and uh, I will you know, let uh, uh, better expert, my good friend Chow Yu, there to talk about this issue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tan. First of all, um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, thank um, the organizer to invite me to talk about the, uh, the topic. Uh, I have to admit, uh, at the first, I'm not expert in this area. Uh, I'm doing the research on international finance. But in past several years, I spent quite a lot of time reading, thinking, and discussing. Uh, on the issue, because I recognize uh, the issue uh, uh, in Northeast Asia uh, will be tremendous impact, not only to China, also on US and the whole world, if we want to deal it correctly. Also, uh, look at my uh, bio. I was partially educated uh, in China and uh, in the United States. I spent 10 years in the States. Uh, after I returned to China, I spent almost, you know, have already 20 years uh, working in China. So with this unique background, I think I can make contribution on the issue from a uh, unique perspective. I hope I can make some uh, meaningful uh, remarks on the issue. Today, um, I'm going to talk about the three parts. First one, I want to talk about the nature of the origin of World War, uh, World War I. Then I will talk about the current relationship among countries in Northeast Asia. The last one, the, the lessons learned from uh, World War I. Um, as I mentioned, I was partially educated in China. I recall in the classroom in my high school, primary school, I, we were taught the nature uh, of uh, First World War uh, actually is the, the uh, European Empire tried to uh, struggle for colony. But later on, when I read more, I understand that maybe that uh, argument not necessarily uh, correct. The question is, whether the nature of the First World War is try this empire try to expand their influence in Balkan or try to get a dominant position in Balkan. 
So before I answer the question, I want to quick overview the relationship of the countries involved in bargaining and their changes. That's uh, uh, Serbia. They have a conflict uh, with the uh, Austrian uh, Hungarian Empire. Uh, actually, in 1912, Hungary, um, Austria Hungary was driven out of a, a bargain. After the Second Bargain War, Serbia became the dominant position uh, in Bargain, a peninsula. That's the struggle between these two uh, countries. Then uh, Russia, Russia tried to have an alliance with uh, Serbia to use that to have influence in Bargain. Then German. Germans have a set uh, in 1879 with alliance with Austrian Hungary. Then France. Due to the war between the German and the France in 1871, actually with the regime of uh, Bismarck, the German took over the province Alsace and the Lorraine uh, from the French. So they have a tremendous tension between Germany and France. After the, the Bismarck left, the William II literally changing the strategy, keep the distance from Russia. Then Russia finally have a form of uh, alliance with the France. That's the whole uh, picture. Then Great Britain, uh, not necessarily directly involve these complicated occasions. But before, just in, uh, before the breakout of war, the Germans decided to attack French through the Belgium, which the touching point to involve greater Britain to the war. So the point I try to make is Britain had been involved with the crisis at the last stage, not at the beginning. Why I want to emphasize, because the Convention custom always sink uh, because the, the, the struggle uh, before First World War is German was a rising power. The Britain is the existing power, so that's the struggle, but I don't think that's correct description. Then after the Britain was involved, the war broke out, become one part is alliance, another the adult. That's the very simple uh, history uh, uh, why the outbreak of the First War. So, of course, the assassination of Archduke uh, Ferdinand by a, a Serbian nationalist was only a touch point. The real reason was the intensified struggle uh, among these empires tried to have a dominant position uh, in Bargain, which led to the, the war. That's my uh, simple conclusion on the reason why First World War uh, outbreak. The second part is the current situation in Northeast Asia. Of course, first of all, economic interaction among these countries become stronger, will continue to be stronger, as Andrew described. Um, Actually, China is the largest trade partner uh, with South Korea and uh, Japan. The second largest uh, trade partner with the U.S. The trade between South Korea and uh, China is more than total sum of South Korea with U.S., South Korea with Japan, South Korea with, with Europe. That's very uh, a heavy position, uh, China uh, with South Korea. Uh, also, China is the largest designation of FDI from Japan and South Korea. U.S. has already made a direct investment in China with 500 billion U.S. dollars. China is the largest credit uh, of U.S. China own 1.2 trillion uh, treasure beer, U.S. treasure beer. But at the same time, the tension still occurred due to uh, uh, disputes 
on several issues, the tension become higher and more intensive. First issue is the territory uh, dispute. That's Japan. Of course, South Korea have a problem with that. China with it. Actually, Russia also a uh, problem with Japan, but I want to simplify it. I didn't put Russia on the picture. Of course, U.S. stay away because Japan is an airline with the U.S. The second issue is conflict between North and South Korea. Of course, U.S. is an alliance of South Korea. Uh, Japan, as I say, China was a quasi aligned with North Korea, but more and more have a, a problem between these two countries. Nuclear uh, proliferation, that's a big issue. North Korea violates several uh, uh, resolutions of the United Nations. So South Korea, uh, United States, Japan, uh, even China was unhappy with the, uh, the action of North Korea. Then historical issues. Japan <laughs> become the heart. North Korea, of course. South Korea and China, these countries thought Japan has not expressed sincerely apology, but Japan of thought, uh, thought their apology uh, has already enough. U.S. keep away uh, on the issue. The last but most important is lack of real trust between U.S. and China, or they may have some strategic interest between these two countries. That's the key element of the tension in Northeast Asia now. China regarded a pivot to, uh, to Asia by U.S. as a content, although U.S. officially denied, as you mentioned that. The strategic uh, dominance or influence between China and the U.S. become the core issue. Japan had problem with China. South Korea, uh, at the same time, with alliance U.S., but the, with China is okay. The last session I want to talk is what the lesson we can learn from World War I. As I say, convention uh, wisdom thought, there's a similarity between uh, Balkan crisis and the current situation, because they thought the, the German was a rising power and the Britain was an existing power. Now China is a rising power, US existing power. But I don't accept that uh, conclusion. I think it is not proper, not accurate, to, simplify, to simply equalize the Balkan crisis last century and the situation in Northeast uh, Asia now. Also, um, that's unfortunately, uh, James Kurz uh, was not here, so in some sense not very fair. I make some comment on, the, on his paper because uh, uh, Tom did a good job uh, summarized the main point of James Kurz. The Kurz paper was excellent, uh, very, good, very good to make a good point, but I not totally agree with his point. He argued due to two reasons. One is hegemonic transition. Second is alliancing system. Due to these two reasons, the war between US and China, the probability between uh, China and the United States is very high, his conclusion. But I don't accept that. But at the same time, I admit several lessons from the war can be learned to reduce or cool down the tension uh, in this area. First of all, close economic relationships are useful and helpful to cool attention down. But 
cannot stop a war from outbreak. That's very important. Even before First uh, World War, they also have a very close uh, relationship among these power. Even good personal relationship cannot stop the war. Actually, the fact is the empire and or king of German Russia and uh, Britain are brother relative. They are cousin, uh, but yes, in some sense they can talk to each other. But at the end, it was still outbreak. That's the one lesson uh, we should learn. The nationalism is a sword with two edges. Media and the intellectuals should take responsibility to keep extreme nationalism away. Here is a bad example. Very famous uh, socialist, Max Weber, um, made his speech at the university. Advocate German should save more colonies. It's unbelievable. So just before the war, more than 1,000 important intellectuals in the German signed a petition to support the idea of Max uh, Weber. That's the uh, tragedy. That's the lesson we should learn. Having alliance is also swore with two ages. Alliance must help you, maybe help you, but at the same time, they may drag you into war. That's the, uh, as James Kerr say, it is an alliance system, uh, which he regarded one of the reasons why the war will break out. Be highly vigilant against the misinformation and the misjudgment on intention and objectives of your rivals. That's also very important. Although due to the technical uh, uh, progress since uh, in past uh, 100 years, that the possibility of misinformation has been dramatically reduced, but the problem is misjudgment uh, still there. Particularly, I want to mention one point. The politicians should not mix up domestic politics and the international relationship. Here is an example. Like President Obama made a very nice speech in the Beijing on APEC meeting. But several days later, when he made a state union in the Congress, he several times bashing China. That's kind of a phenomenon for mature export to understand because Obama faced different audience. But for average people in the street, they feel badly. They saw Obama like a two-face. That's created some uh, misjudgment, misinformation. Also, it's the same thing for Chinese leaders. In November, I guess, um, last year, Vice Premier Wang Yang made a speech in Chicago in the meeting between China and U.S. They call some um, business uh, commercial uh, uh, meeting. Mr. Wang made a very nice uh, remarks. Basically, he say China has no ability and a willingness to challenging the dominance of U.S. in the international uh, economic order, something like that. My friend called me from Hong Kong. He said, "Either did you see that?" I said, "No." He said, "You check some uh, website. They have an English uh, translation there." I did see that. But unfortunately, several days ago, I checked Chinese new newspaper, never see that. That's something, you know, I guess Chinese leader also try to show their face in different audience. That's something I guess should be uh, changing. Otherwise, we'll create some misjudgment, particularly among the people, among the decision makers. The last point is the key players should take more responsibility to explore all ways to push through peaceful solution. Previously in the First World War uh, is Britain, uh, uh, 
German and Russia. Now it's U.S. and China should, should pay this law. I guess several principles uh, regard the relation between China and the U.S. Uh, should be carried out. Uh, that's my uh, purpose. First, when both sides have to real, realize a peaceful coexistence will be the best way to be beneficial to people of these two countries and over the world. That's the, something uh, simple but most important. The second is <clears throat> this coexistence has to be based on current international laws and regulations. While partial improvement, partial changes will be allowed with the due process, due uh, procedures. If you do something on the procedure with the most consents, maybe you can do that. Three, for the territory uh, disputes, China should continue to carry out the principle to put aside the difference jointly develop resource. That principle presented by Mr. Deng Xiaoping. Why U.S. should keep its promise to be to be really neutral on the territory dispute. The D, the fourth, China has to recognize U.S. still is, will continue to be one of a major place in the region, while U.S. has to tolerate and comply with the, the rational request with a rising economic stress within existing international order. Here is a, is a good example, I, uh, AIIB. Why finally AIIB get so much support, even from Western, many Western countries? Because of several reasons behind that. Not only uh, China have a lot of money, because part of the reason created by US itself in 2010, the G20 passed the resolution to carry the court and governance reform for, inter for IMF. The, the reform should be carried out by the end of 2012, but the U.S. Congress refused to approve the package. That's dam a tremendous damage on the, the, the image and the legitimacy of IMF. Of course, then China do by itself to set up the, the new financial institution to uh, support or supplement the current existing economic institution. That makes sense because people think that's legitimate. At the same time, the, the Chinese government did a good job because they from my understanding, they hide the employee on the international stand, even hide someone from developed countries, which show China really uh, determinate, try to put everything on the table. I guess that's the good example. Both China and the U.S. should learn from that. For China, that's the best way. You're using uh, the 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 you accumulate the saving to do something win-win cooperation. For U.S., you have to understand, if you don't allow China growing up, do something, but finally you fail. Like Larry Summer to have an article criticize uh, current administration. But I also remind uh, that the Asia financial crisis it was uh, Larry Summer who called uh, U.S. Uh, Japanese official at midnight, asked Japan stop to establish an Asia financial uh, organization, something like that. Actually, if you look back, if that time, if U.S. supported Japan to set up something, now situation totally different. So I guess U.S. should learn from that. So my conclusion is I'm not convinced a war or direct conflict between U.S. and China is inevitable, or its probability is very high. 
Nobody know what the probability is. Nobody know that. Therefore, it is most important for us not to guess what it is, but try hard to avoid. That's my conclusion. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. I think this was very enlightening for all of us uh, to explore some of the uh, economic issues that we're hoping we we'll... Thank <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, in exploring some of the economic issues that uh, I think uh, will hopefully steer us away from these tensions getting out of control and looking a little bit more at some of the historical forces that are playing into them. Um, and also, as Professor Shang points out, the broader geopolitical issues. Um, can America really even afford to take on some of the tensions um, that it has uh, promised to back its allies in, in the Far East? Um, why don't we open this up to questions? Why don't we take a few questions and um, we'll, we'll collect them and then have Professor Shang and Professor Chow answer. So. Why don't we start from here? Uh, so the trade argument is very uh, is very uh, convincing to some extent, uh, but at the at the start of World War One, it was a similar perception in academic circles in London, because uh, they didn't expect the war, saying there was too much trade between the empires. So we might want to rethink this this argument as being sufficient for not uh, landing up in war. Secondly. Uh, we are looking at Northeast Asia, but the uh, but the, pow the powder keg might be somewhere else, just like the Balkans was for the First World War. The empires, uh, so if you look at London, uh, Paris, and other big capitals, that's not where the trouble began. It started somewhere else. So we might perhaps want to look at, I don't know, Pakistan, Myanmar, Afghanistan, that region. That's where uh, the fire might be lit, and then it might spread all the way to Japan and South Korea uh, due to alliances and other dynamics. And uh, thirdly, uh, at a more international level, uh, there was nothing like a UN at the start of the First World War. So the First World War led to the creation of the League of Nations, which also wasn't sufficient to prevent the Second World War. And then the UN was created. And the UN doesn't seem to be uh, in a position, perhaps, to, to deal with the coming challenges. So your views on this, thank you. My question is uh, to both Professor Sheng and Mr. Zhao. Uh, even if there is no Balkan-style outright war uh, in East Asia, uh, as you said, uh, there could still be uh, very serious conflicts between uh, the great powers in this area. How small countries like South Korea uh, could balance itself between China and the US, especially when uh, their interest to conflict over this area. Could you uh, introduce yourself, please? Uh, I'm South Korean journalist, John. And... Sorry, Ritwan, I'm a graduate student in math, but I'm fascinated by these things. Thank you. Hello, I'm Zimmermann, Deutsche Welle, a journalist. Um, I very interested to know what your thoughts are on the uh, why there is conflict over relatively trivial small islands in the waters. Uh, to me, it seems, looking from a distance as a, as a German and Canadian journalist, that the, the, the reasons for the geographic tensions in that region are so small, uh, and, and yet they seem to be so intensely felt on the part of both Japan and China, for example, and some of the other countries. Um, so one question is, why is it so intensely felt over such small areas when the overwhelming balance of interests, as, as, as Dr. Sheng has said and, and as uh, Dr. Chow has said, is for peaceful uh, further development and, and uh, co-development of these economies and, and have every reason uh, for them to continue to cooperate. So and then I have two subsidiary questions. One is, is there potential for resolving these conflicts by agreeing somehow to co-own these, uh, these little islands and put them in some sort of a jointly owned trust 
uh, that would uh, maybe be a forerunner of something like a European Union-style organization in the East, but co-own it, co-develop it, co-benefit, use the profits from any oil and gas that's found in order to uh, have some joint projects within, uh, within the Asian region, which is intended to create harmony between the peoples there. The second subsidiary question, um, have people in China, looking at the geostrategic questions, uh, are they fully aware of America's role in the world and America's strategy in the world? Which, if I understand it correctly, uh, reading, for example, Stratfor, which is a, an organization short for strategic forecasting, uh, emphasizes very strongly the idea that America intends to remain the world's hegemon and that America uses a balance of power strategy in all regions. So right now it's playing off Europe and Russia against each other within the Ukrainian situation. It's playing off the Shiites and Sunnis against each other, an ancient rivalry in the Middle East, supplying arms and training to soldiers on both sides, actually, of that divide, just as it did in the past between uh, the war between Iraq under Saddam Hussein and Iran, encouraging that war, supplying both sides as weapons and so on. Uh, and in the far in east, uh, from, from a German point of view, it's the Far East, uh, you've got uh, America systematically building alliances and do dominating the seas, you know, using Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, and so on as an offshore air, uh, aircraft carrier, India, to encircle the rising power of China. And, and has it, is it clear to people in that region that the United States is following uh, a strategy in which it uses proxies uh, to fight its... Uh, most dangerous competitors, to, to avoid a peer competitor from arising in the world that might be powerful enough to challenge the United States, which is why it wants to prevent any type of real alliance between Russia and Europe, why it also wants to contain China by having by playing off the other Asian countries against China, not because it wants a war, it just doesn't want to have a powerful peer competitor. Uh, and and how, does, how does China... Uh, see that rivalry and what is China's strategy uh, to deal with that? It would seem to me the best strategy would be to make friends with all its neighbors and to reconcile with Japan, reconcile with Taiwan, reconcile with South Korea because naturally in the long term China will be the leader in that region. Elizabeth Laws with 13D Research. Um, two questions, one um, kind of following off on part of that but um, and a different spin or maybe a more positive one as far as U.S. and China relations. Um, from a positive standpoint, if the, for the Americans or parts of the U.S. that have accepted that there's a multipolar world and that China and the U.S. Are, are more equals in the world now and both strong powers, what do you think that the U.S. could do to help build and engender a better trust relationship with China? Um, and the second question about Korean unification um, you know, how do you see the possibility of that happening? And what do you think China's response would be um, to movements toward unification? Thanks. I'm not an, uh, uh, um, uh, I, I take the first uh, point, don't overestimate trade. I, you know, I mean, husband and wives quarrel over the most trivial matters. So uh, I, never, I, I never estimate, uh, uh, overestimate, you know, the possibility of conflict, right? I mean, you know, it, you know so if we can't even manage a family, uh, uh, can, can we manage, you know, national affairs? And, the only answer is checks and balances in the system, right? Um, on the question of uh, small islands, I, uh, we should never underestimate that some of the conflicts, if you really look at them over the past years, have been fishing rights, very similar to Iceland. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, fish is a very major diet for Asians. Uh, and there is a risk that the region, uh, the, the, that, that maritime area, uh, is, is beginning to suffer from overfishing. And so, you know, uh, since fishermen also have a very uh, major interest, uh, you know, in their livelihood, 
uh, don't be surprised, uh, you know, there are conflicts that arise from that, right? Uh, uh, so, you know, but, but, but that's an issue I'm not an expert. Uh, on America's role, I think, uh, you know, I think foreigners spend more time trying to understand America than probably Americans try and understand foreigners. Uh, uh, you know, I, I do appreciate that uh, Americans have uh, great research institutes, etc. Uh, but 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 that is you know, two percent of the population of the Americans have uh, passports, uh, uh, you know, and maybe only a three percent for China. So the but but uh, uh, you know by and large, uh, the world is Pax America, uh, in which American culture plays a very major role. Uh, Hollywood has a very ma major uh, impact, uh, and uh, today you go around anywhere in Asia. Uh, they are wearing Nike shoes, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, Tommy Hilfiger uh, uh, T-shirts. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it may be made in Asia, but they're they're they're, they're American brands. So I I, I don't see, you know, uh, an issue. I think you know what I think uh, people uh, probably have not paid enough attention to uh, is this climate change problem. And that climate change will have major impact on the world uh, because climate warming uh, will cause uh, burning up and more food security, water shortages uh, problems. Okay, and uh, uh, you know today, uh, if you really look at the Chinese uh, plans, uh, uh, anti-pollution uh, issues, uh, energy resource uh, security is very high up uh, in this area, right? Uh, and America has the best technology on uh, energy conservation uh, experience with, uh, uh, you know, uh, cleaning up pollution, uh, uh, forestry uh, preservation, uh, et cetera. And so there are many areas in which uh, China and America, uh, and in future India, Africa, uh, ASEAN, uh, don't forget ASEAN. ASEAN's uh, 600 million population and 2.5 trillion uh, dollars of uh, GDP. Um, these are, you know, uh, huge, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, commitments on 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 the possibility of uh, uh, climate change changing the environment. Uh, let me give you a simple number, which was quoted to me by a Vietnamese uh, minister of finance. Uh, at a conference, uh, he said that if by 2050, uh, or, or maybe later, if the sea level rises more than three meters, uh, or, or, or you know, uh, 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 you know, one one meter, uh, maybe something like 20 percent of the Mekong Delta uh, rice-producing areas will be affected. And as we all know, the Mekong Delta uh, is one of the key rice producers in the world, right? I mean, so. So, you know, the, uh, all these have, have, have a huge uh, 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 impact, and I think it would be very, very important for, um, uh, um, uh, you know, for cooperation and work on a higher moral plane uh, than fighting each other. Uh, you know, let me give you a simple illustration, right? Um, you know, uh, if I'm not wrong, an aircraft carrier these days, including its supporting fleet, is about $6 billion. Six billion, and, and, and it consumes fuel, uh, uh, it, it can destroy the world, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, but $6 billion can do a lot in terms of uh, financing uh, uh, climate change uh, issues, which is starving out for, you know, for finance. My last uh, uh, question is from South Korea. Don't, don't call South Korea a small country. South Korea GDP is today the size of Spain, if I'm not wrong. Uh, uh, you know, and South Korea plus North Korea uh, is 100 plus population. Uh, so the, the, if, if, if South Korea and North Korea are unified, uh, it will be a major powerhouse. Uh, you know, uh, the, the demographics would fit perfectly because South Korea is aging, and North Korea, if I, at my understanding, my very shallow understanding, is as much, 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 much better uh, fit. Um, it would make uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula, as an economy, 
uh, a, a, a more equal between China, uh, 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 Japan, and, 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 and the Korean uh, uh, peninsula. So I, I think it would be more uh, peaceful for everybody, you know, in the long run, put it this way, uh, if, if, if there is peace in the uh, Korean peninsula. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't see this as a threat at all. Uh, uh, it's a, you know, it is a, it is a, 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 a further step towards uh, greater stability in the region. Okay, let me answer the first question you raised. Yes, uh, actually the point I, I have already made in my presentation, I fully agree uh, your point is uh, close trade relationship is not good enough uh, stop war, uh, although it's useful and helpful. Um, as for United Nations, yes, it's not uh, function very well, but it is at least is the international organization there. Uh, you look back the, the first, uh, first uh, World War and the Second World War, there's no such kind of organization. But still, I think United Nations is a good tool uh, for peaceful uh, solution of the big issue in the world. Otherwise, you, you don't have any uh, better uh, uh, institution to do that. Of course, for major power should support a uh, United Nations. The second question, uh, assuming uh, you are right, South Korea is still a small country, uh, which remind me uh, what the former uh, Prime Minister of German, Bismarck, uh, said more than 100 years ago. He said, the best strategy for small country is make balance among big power. For big power, the best strategy is to align with some small countries. You look at what happened now. Singapore has done that, doing very well. They play game between China and the US. In one point, they offend both but at the same time, they get support from both. Now you look at what is Vietnamese doing. Before they are party secretary visiting United States, now they are visiting China. In this sense, I think South Korea also doing very well. Security, you have to rely, more rely on United States. Economic relations, you have to more rely on China. You are doing very well, make a balance between China and, uh, and, uh, and the US. I guess China and the US understand the position of South Korea. The, I can tell you one episode. In November last year, uh, we discussed the, the, the possible uh, funding country join the AIIB. At uh, the time, I guess sooner or later, South Korea will join. Finally, after the Britain joined the AIB, give you excuse, give you coverage. Now you can join. You ask no reason to blame you. They have to blame you. UK first. That's the way a small country work in the world. Um, yes, for the third question, yes, I guess the Chinese government understand that the U.S. strategy, uh, they want to keep the uh, hegemony over the world. Uh, so you look at what Deng Xiaoping say, they, he doesn't want the China uh, be out to direct conflict with the U.S. Uh, actually, Chinese government understand that oh, usually we say the second large position is very hard because number one guy try to push you down. The small, your small brother jealous with you. So you are second, it's in the very hard position. Um, of course, I, after the 
outbreak of global financial crisis, some corner of China, a little bit more, from my point of view, a little bit too self-confidence. They think, oh, now it's time for China to become superpower. We are doing very well, so maybe we, you know, same day we can replace U.S. But majority people or the final decision maker of Chinese government understand is not that way. So definitely they don't want to challenge the strategy of U.S. They understand the U.S. had been very good on large strategy. You look at what position U.S. took in the, during the two world war. They get a tremendous benefit from two world war. Of course, now is potential for China, also for U.S. to make big mistake. If U.S. made a mistake, direct conflict with China, maybe that's the turning point for U.S. decline. The, for China, they understand. I guess that's the, um, the President Xi Jinping say, or the core of foreign policy is win-win cooperation. That's why the, the Vice Premier Wang Yang said in Chicago, they, do, they understand that the U.S. dominant position in international uh, order. So the best way is for China is step by step because the, the, the first priority for Chinese government to develop their domestic economy. If you want to do that, you have to keep good relation with other countries. Otherwise, no way you can continue to develop your economy. Uh, that's, I guess, currently Chinese strategy. What about those small island conflicts? Oh, yeah. It's a really travel. No reason for that. But why? I guess several uh, reasons behind that. One is historically, because Japanese uh, defeated uh, uh, China in we call Java War uh, uh, 120 years ago. Uh, that's the turning point of, for China from strong power to be uh, weaker. Also, during the Second War, Japanese invaded in, into China. So the, the national feeling still not very uh, good between China and, uh, and uh, Japan. That's the one reason, because from Chinese perspective, yes, just small island, maybe some resource uh, under well sometimes, yes, but uh, the feel, they feel lost the face for Chinese. They think that's the key issue. If we, China, really want to become power, we cannot bullet by Japanese again. I guess that's the mentality of some Chinese uh, people there. I'm not going to say that's correct, but that's, I just try to explain why, you know, for that. That different perspective, you back in 2010, the, some Japanese privately tried to buy the island. From J Japanese government perspective, they say, hey, we nationalize, well, which give us the convenience to deal with Chinese government. But from Chinese perspective, you nationalize, that means you own it permanently. We cannot accept that. That's the reason to uh, have a conflict occurred. But of course, for a while, both sides understand. That's heard both sides. So that's the reason why Xi Jinping and uh, meet uh, Abe in the APEC meeting. I guess in past several months, both sides a little bit cooled down. But of course, tension still there, but, uh, which I guess better than one year ago. One year ago. The last question is, yes, from positive side, um, yes, I guess some uh, scholars, like a former director of Peterson International Economics uh, uh, Institute of International Economics, Bergen, uh, he proposed G2, 
that means U.S. and China uh, become a major player in the world. Of course, his argument was reputed by many scholars, uh, not, never officially uh, taken by U.S. Also, Chinese um, officially immediately uh, refused the concept of G2. Uh, from my, my personal perspective, it's not necessary for Chinese government to immediately refuse that. You don't say yes, you also don't say no. Let it happen. That, that's my perspective. Otherwise, you send the wrong message to U.S. government. That means you don't have an intention to keep a good relation with the U.S. Of course, it's not the fact, but may some uh, wrongly interpretation for Chinese refuse that. Uh, for the unification uh, of <laughs> Korea Peninsula, yes, principally, Chinese government support the unification of Korea. That's the, uh, I guess, the common will uh, of people of uh, both sides. Of course, I have to admit, some part of uh, Chinese community worry about uh, one uh, possibility. If, if unification uh, led by not South Korea, maybe someday U.S. troops will stay the border of China. That's something they worry about. Yes, principally, general direction, yes, they support that. That's some uh, worry, maybe from military per perspective. If the U.S. troops just stand in the border with China, China don't feel comfortable. So far, no any tell you, actually, China is relative to U.S. China really in the difficult position. I mean, they have lots of neighboring countries, 24 neighboring countries. Uh, lots of them have a, a dispute, uh, for territory dispute. Not like the U.S. You only have Mexico and Canada. No territory issue. Yes, maybe some small issue but no territory issue. But China have 24 neighboring countries. They have already solved the, the, all of the problem with 22 countries. Only two countries haven't solved, one with India, one maybe with Japan. Uh, but you look at the history, usually when negotiation between China as, and the neighboring country on the territory, usually China give more compromising more. If you look at the results of some research done by foreign uh, scholars, I don't remember the, the name of the research, you can find, they find a way uh, to do that. Also, the current administration under the pressure of uh, average people, the way not necessarily in, in US, uh, people just can openly criticize uh, uh, government uh, in the newspaper in somewhere, but still the people in China have a different view on the previous administration. In terms of foreign affairs, they have two things average people don't feel happy with the previous administration. One is they think Chinese government has been too soft in the dis uh, dispute in South China Sea, the territory because so many countries have already occupied the island, so many islands, they get a lot of oil from that. That's one complaint. Second complaint is they feel Chinese government go too far try to keep close relation with North Korea. <laughs> because yes, they understand that you have to keep a good relation with North Korea, show your courtesy, but one time I recall was a leader of North Korea visit China. All of seven members of the Standing Political Bureau came out to meet him. People say, why? Why all of them come out? Maybe they're due to some internal reason. They, nobody wants to take responsibility. That's maybe the reason behind that. But at least that's the fact. Uh, average people, I mean, Chinese people, maybe privately complain of that. That's the maybe part of the reason you can understand why the new administration in some way become a little bit tougher, a little bit harder in some issue. That's my answer.
Um, I just wanted to raise a general observation. I'm Vincent Garton. I'm a historian and political scientist at the University of Cambridge. Um, it seems to me that, to some extent, the Balkan analogy is, is misplaced in the sense that if you look at World War I, the Balkan crises were not necessary to the outbreak of that war. They were the proximal cause, but there were plenty of other flashpoints that could have led to war, like the Moroccan crises. And it seems to me that if we're worried about war in East Asia, what we should be concerned about in this historical analogy is not whether East Asia is the Balkans, because it seems to me that in many ways it's not, but whether East Asia is or will in the future be something similar to the great power relationships in Europe as a whole at that time. And it seems to me that if you look maybe several decades into the future, not now, when perhaps American influence in East Asia has receded, possibly, then the proliferation of, of so-called binary relationships, that is, states that have the possibility of conflict with each other in Asia, could mean that conflict within Asia on a regional scale, not necessarily World War III, could be more likely. So I just wanted to raise that as, a, as, a, as an observation on, I guess, each of the papers which dealt with this issue. In the context of the question, uh, where do you see India in all this? Because it, it's after China, it's still like uh, an, um, uh, an emerging power in the region. It has equations, uh, power equations with the US, with China, with Japan. So wh wh where do you see India in all this? Thank you. You know, uh, I, 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 I gave a paper once which said that uh, if the West is worried about China, there are two, uh, which has 1.3 uh, billion population. There are two other 1.3 billion populations 15, 25 years away. India, you know, is probably demographically much more balanced than China because China is one child policy. Uh, GDP wise, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, one fourth, but 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 already growth rate uh, uh, matching that of China uh, within the next uh, 15 20 years uh, India will be a major global power okay uh, maybe not yet of the first rank but uh, certainly very close to it I mean uh, 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 and, and and India is a huge is a subcontinent I mean so so in you know it's there and then you know don't forget that there's 1.6 billion Muslims out there uh, all the way ranging from Indonesia to the Middle East uh, and Africa, um, uh, which uh, you know sits on some of the world's uh, most important uh, energy resources, <laughs> uh, and uh, some of them you know already nuclear powers. So, you know, the multipolarization of the world is not just U.S., Europe, uh, and uh, uh, you know China. Uh, within the next uh, 25 years, uh, India will join it, uh, and uh, certainly, um, you know, if, if pure de demographics, uh, according to the United Nations uh, calculations, by 2100, uh, the population of Nigeria will be 847 million people. So, you know, uh, you know, the, the world is changing much faster than most people realize. And where did I get these statistics? From the Samsung Research Institute, uh, you know, you know, these projections tell me the game is changing very fast, and uh, we need to think about this in a very, very different way. On that note, I hope you all will join me in thanking.